a republic is, is quintessentially Islamic, it's also quintessentially American. And the concept of compassionate justice is also quintessentially both. Uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, some people, particularly politicians, uh, think that uh, power is what really matters. Beyond mere power, the natural law of compassionate justice, an Islamic perspective. The concept of justice as an expression of natural law is central to every civilized legal system and is important in every world religion. Central to justice is respect for human responsibilities and rights, a major challenge today in interfaith dialogue as well as international public policy. It's whether Islam as a religion both calls for such respect and deserves it. The major issue in determining what natural uh, law is probably started uh, with Socrates, who supported two different positions. One was supported by his student Plato, uh, who said that uh, uh, natural law is the order of reality uh, that we can seek. Uh, we will never know exactly what reality is, but it, we were born to seek it. Uh, now, Aristotle was a student of Plato, and he said, uh, no, it, it's a question of, of justice, and, and I would say it's a question of compassionate justice. And Aristotle said, we can determine what justice is through our own intellectual reasoning. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have to come from a transcendent source, it comes from our own reasoning power. And these are two quite different approaches. Aristotle took the ethical approach. He was interested in ethics. Uh, Plato was interested in ultimate truth. Now, this distinction passed all the way down to the present era. Uh, and, and during the height of the, the Islamic Renaissance uh, in the, the 10th century, Avicenna, uh, was the great uh, expo uh, proponent and, and uh, scholar of natural law. Uh, and he took Aristotle's approach. Uh, natural law is, is or, well, I mean, they, they were using the word justice, but we can use the term natural law. Uh, natural law, uh, uh, according to Avicenna, was what Aristotle said. It's what human beings, through their reasoning power, say it is. The most egregious denial of human rights is to deny the right of others to define and interpret their own religions, because this is a denial of human dignity and human freedom. The base case should be Islam as a religion, not Muslims as they sometimes understand and practice it in pursuit of political agendas. This is the basis of respect both by and for Muslims within the community of Abrahamic faiths. It links the essence of every religion in the world, uh, the essence of Christianity, the essence of Islam, and also the differences within each religion. Uh, is natural law, is justice, something that comes out of our own brains, or is it something that we have to study, that we have to seek, uh, and there's, there's a whole field of study called ontology, uh, which is the search for ultimate reality. This should be the basis for long-range planning, especially for Muslims and Jews, who throughout most of their history during the past thousand years have been each other's most reliable friends. Governments, of course, must base policy on practical threat analysis, not on theory. But equal emphasis should be placed on opportunity analysis in the pursuit of compassionate justice through peaceful engagement as an end goal in both domestic and foreign policy. People can seek from revelation, 
from even from personal uh, inspiration, uh, although that would not be binding on other people, uh, and from studying the scientific laws of the universe, and then combining the two. If you see a conflict between the two, you misunderstand at least one of them. Uh, so that, that's one definition of, of law. And why do people follow it? Um, of course, there's a question whether people do follow it. Uh, now there's the two or three answers to that. I like the answer that uh, Thomas Merton gave, who was a, 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 a I think he was a Cistercian monk. Uh, and he said, everybody was born was created as a unique individual. So this, this means that your identity uh, involves seeking truth. And if you uh, follow what uh, you have found uh, and, and the, the principles that come from it, your, your, pur your purpose in life is to follow it. And that's your identity. The base case for all followers of the Abrahamic faith who share an opportunity mentality as distinct from an exclusively threat mentality should be not the extremes but the balanced middle as understood by the great jurisprudence, philosophers, and spiritual leaders over the course of more than a thousand years of interpreting Islamic scriptures. This includes the Quran, the Hadith, or traditions about the sayings and practices of the Prophet Muhammad and his earlier followers, and the scholarly writings of the great intellectual leaders, most of whom have been imprisoned or executed for trying to maintain the purity of Islam as a religion. For, for, for Muslims, I would divide uh, the Makasid Asharia, which are the principles of law, uh, uh, from the the, uh, the, the, the practice, which is the fiqh. The, the fiqh are the, the specific rules. But uh, al-Shatabi, al who was the, probably the greatest master of the Makassid al-Shariya, of the higher principles, uh, said that no uh, fiqh law is valid uh, unless it serves to implement the higher purposes. If you see that it does not implement the higher purposes, it's not law. Two paradigms of scriptural interpretation have been debated among Muslims since the very beginning. These are whether the messages of God in various religions should be interpreted as exclusive or inclusive. Historically, the exclusive approach often condemning to hell all who disagree with a particular interpreter has gained influence, even dominance, in the presence of existential fear, of perceived mortal threats from the other. Such existential fears fuel the challenges within each religion who would hijack it in their worship of themselves as false gods infueled with hatred for everyone who refuses to bow down to their claims of exclusive possession of ultimate truth. And of course then you get to the question, what are the higher purposes? Uh, in every religion they have this distinction between the, the little laws which if they're applied without a higher purpose can result in injustice or can be just plain stupid, and, and there are such laws in every religion. <laughs> but there are also principles in every religion. And the importance of one versus the other uh, 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 is a major challenge in every religion. The inclusive approach, on the other hand, welcomes the followers of other paths to God as part of the divine design for all of humanity. This paradigm of thought, which has been the most pervasive in the spread of Islam throughout the world, has been advanced especially by the Sufis. The majority of the Muslims in the world, both Sunni and Shi'i, follow one of the Sufi paths. They believe that the purpose of divine revelation 
is to unify the common purpose of all persons and communities, not at the level of politics, but at the level of worship and morality. The common purpose is love of God, which is every person's reason for existence. But the path to this end have always been found in the externals of religious diversity. As persons converge from the externals on the circumference of a circle towards the oneness of God, at the center, they themselves can become unified in action. The spiritual leaders believe that this unity in purpose through diversity in means is the only way to turn justice from merely a utopian word into practice. They believe that this unity of diversity is the only way to turn compassionate justice into a practical reality. The governing paradigm of thought among those who follow the inner meaning of their religion is loving submission to God in response to God as the initiator of love. This kind of submission, known by Muslims as taqwa, gives meaning to everything else. This is the root of the opportunity mentality and is the best base for dialogue and mutual cooperation in addressing the practical issues of conscience in both domestic and foreign policy in the world today. Because it is based on the mutual respect among the followers of all the world religions. The challenge thereby becomes not a class of civilizations based on a chasm of purpose between irreconcilable cultures. The major challenge is not even a chasm of meaning within each civilization. Rather, it is the growing chasm between humanity and God. The Shar is the, the, according to the Quran, is the law that applies to all human beings. Uh, the Sharia is a specific application of this wider law uh, uh, in terms of principles. The, sh the Sharia are principles. And uh, I can go into what those are because that would be the definition of natural law. Uh, they're, they're different, uh, you know, the, the classical formulation has five of these basic principles. Uh, 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 Al-Shatabi, whom I mentioned, uh, said there is no set uh, number of these. Uh, it depends on the context, it depends on the individual scholar. Uh, uh, and and the, the, he said there can be more than five. Uh, anybody can justify whatever number they want if they are scholars. Uh, and uh, I divide them into, I mean, I say there are eight. Uh, and the first four are principles of guidance. The next four that I identify are principles of application. Now, the, the, uh, the, among the guidance principles, the first one is haq adin. Uh, that is freedom of religion. Uh, that's throughout the Quran everywhere. If you don't have freedom of religion, you're, uh, you're a slave. Uh, uh, and the, the second one is Hakan Nas, which is the duty to respect the human person. And uh, right to life is part of that. Uh, the, the laws of just war, the very strict requirements for a just war, uh, which uh, the United States usually does not observe, uh, they are binding everywhere. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to justify war in Islam. There's, they're laid out. Doesn't mean that all Muslims practice them. Uh, the, the third one is Hak uh, al-Nasa, and that is the duty to respect human community. Uh, the, the family, uh, you can call it the, the, the tribe, whatever you want, the, the village, the nation, uh, and, and because, well, the, 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 the second one, Hak al-Nasa, posits the sacredness of the human person. Hakal Naso posits the sacredness of human community because it comes from the sacredness of the human person. It doesn't come from some sultan on top. It comes from the sacredness of all the people. And the fourth one 
of these guidance principles uh, is respect, and these are all respect, respect for, respect for, respect for ecological uh, harmony. Uh, the entire world is a reflection, uh, in, in, in fact, a manifestation of God. Therefore, it is sacred. You are a manifestation of God. That's why you're sacred. You must recognize that uh, the sacredness of creation uh, includes very much the sacredness of everything in it, the animals, the trees, uh, the, the atmosphere. Now, this is not one of the uh, 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 standard uh, makasid, and the reason is that this is emphasized so much in the Quran, they didn't even have to make it a principle. I mean, everybody assumed this. Uh, uh, so then the, the second set are principles of application. Uh, and I won't go into this because it would take a book to do so. But uh, the, the first one is, is uh, Haq al-Mal. Uh, and, and that is the duty to respect uh, private property, uh, to respect a banking system that uh, broadens ownership rather than, than concentrates it, uh, a, a perspective that is, whose principal aim is compassionate justice. Uh, that's the haq al-mal, the, the respect for uh, uh, economic justice. The next one is haq um, al-huriya, uh, which is respect for uh, political justice. Uh, and, uh, of course, in my view, uh, that means respect for constitutional democracy, uh, for which the best model ever was the uh, Constitution of Medina, which uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, created and, and implemented as a model. It's very interesting because when I give a lecture on what is Islamic uh, law of governance, my students would complain that it, ha it left a lot of silences, sort of empty spaces. Why? Why didn't it tell us exactly what the system should look like? And my answer was because each country each people and nation have a different history and they might want a different rule system of government. Look at Britain, look at the United States, look at France. They all have different systems of governance and we call them all democracies, right? That's right. So in Islam, what the approach of the Quran was simply to articulate the basic principles that are necessary in any government before it could be just, a minimum basis. And one of them is that whoever is governing in that country must be selected freely by the people. Now, this is an important concept, the concept of contract. We see it in the marriage in Islam, we see it in the commercial area, we see it in the political area. And the emphasis is on consent. And consent cannot be, um, cannot be pressured, uh, forced, it has to be not only acceptance, but rida. And rida means the full psychological comfort of saying yes. So, in every contract we're talking about, whether it is a commercial one, whether it's a marital one, whether it is a governmental one, we need that kind of rida for the head of state. Now, why are we even talking about contracts in Islam in governance? Because that's the model the Prophet gave us when he went to Medina. As a prophet invited by the people of, the Med of Medina, and he came in and uh, he established a mosque, and the people said, we want you to be our leader. In other words, he didn't say, I'm the prophet, therefore I should be the leader. Most conservative definition of Sharia is that those laws set in the revelation, in the Quran, or rules. But then there is another derivative meaning, which is uh, those uh, laws developed by jurists or interpretations developed by jurists from the Quran. And uh, these, as you might know, reflect not only the inherent meaning in the words of the Quran, but also the ability of the jurists to understand them 
as best as he or she could in light of their cultural experience and their personal situation. Sharia that is based on jurisprudence is not as pure as the Sharia laid down in the Quran. The one laid down in the Quran is for all times and places. It's not a Sharia for the Arabs. It's not a Sharia for uh, the seventh century. It's also a Sharia for the United States, for Europe, for Asia, for whoever, just like Christianity and Judaism. It's not restricted to a specific geographical area. And therefore you would expect that jurists who are interpreting uh, the Sharia laid down in the Quran will see it differently depending not only on the place they are in, but also on the time as well. So we know that different centuries have led to different jurisprudence, but also even Imam Shafi'i, when he developed the jurisprudence uh, um, of this Shafi'i school in Baghdad, and then left to Egypt, he developed a second school of thought, which is this Shafi'i school of thought in Egypt, because the conditions were different, the perspective was different. Of course, the basic laws laid down in the Quran, these are non-changeable. The uh, difference in interpretation of, sh uh, of Sharia is not always a matter of um, only culture. Um, different people look at things differently. A simple example, is the cup half full or half empty, right? That is not necessarily a cultural issue. That might be a psychological issue <laughs> or some other thing. And all of this affects the way you understand what is being said, either by other scholars or in the Quran. Um, one major issue I have found, and I need to highlight it in this discussion, is that a lot of people in the U.S., a lot of Muslims in the U.S. recently, have been writing either translations of the Qur'an or engaging in jurisprudence based on the translations of the Qur'an, not on the original Qur'an in the original language. I shouldn't say original Qur'an, there is only one Qur'an, and the rest are attempts at translating it in which much of the meaning is often lost. So to base your jurisprudence on something that is not the Qur'an itself is really very troubling to scholars, even if we're not talking religion, even if we're talking academia. And then how, how serious is it when you're developing ideas about the Qur'an based not on the Qur'an itself, but on what some person thought it meant? Here's, here's one big problem. The other big problem is that in the Arab societies themselves, after colonialism, this has been a weakened uh, understanding of the Arabic language because of the colonialist policies of smothering Arabic and trying to replace it with other languages. As a result, we find now jurists who are not very strong in Arabic, uh, making um, sometimes outlandish <laughs> interpretations based on confusion. From my perspective, the analogy between the Sharia and the Islamic jurisprudence, which is properly called fiqh, mm -hmm. is uh, the analogy between the laws of nature mm -hmm and scientific theories about the law of nature. Yes. For example, gravity, we know it exists. You have some kind of gut feeling for what it is, but what is it really? Mm -hmm. We turn to scientists to explain it, and they explain it, but their explanations have varied throughout history. Yes, yes. To Aristotle, gravity was the tendency of everything to be at the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. To Newton, it was the mutual attractive force between any two objects in the universe. Mm -hmm. To Einstein, it's the shape of space. Yes. These explanations are very, very different from one another, and yet we're always talking about the same underlying reality mm -hmm. of gravity. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's the case with Sharia. Sharia 
the path to the water, and we all know how important water is, especially for the desert peoples where the revelation first came. Mm -hmm. The path to the water is whatever it is, whatever God has decreed it to be. Just like gravity is whatever God has decreed it to be. Yes. And the scholars attempt to understand it and articulate it as a form of guidance for people who want to get to the water. Yes. That's the fic, that's the jurisprudence. So it's the difference between a landscape and the map of the landscape. Mm. I'm hard pressed to recall a conversation where I've gotten to a debate about Sharia. Sure. You know, I sure. mean, people might talk about, um, and my experience is that people talk more about Allah, mm. the Quran, the Sunnah, or the example of the Prophet Muhammad. I mean, all these things make up the overarching uh, Sharia, you know, they're part of the, the entire revelation, they're part of the experience and the part of life of the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um, but as I understand it, uh, through history and time, different, and even now, different countries, um, and different countries that will say that they are Islamic countries, yeah. um, implement various aspects, and I'll say it this way, various aspects of what they understand to be in the Quran mm -hmm. and the Sunnah of the Prophet and say that this is their implementation of Sharia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've, I think I've read where like in Indonesia, and, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, where in many countries that are were under colonialism, they, they, they might follow, follow a civil law that's based on their previous colonizer for most things, and then when it comes to personal affairs, they do some version of Sharia. The universal spiritual paradigm of natural law. The human thought consists of gathering the bits and pieces of life into comprehensible categories and then perhaps categorize these into discrete paradigms or frameworks of thought. Two frameworks that have always competed in human life have been power and justice. Since the era of the first caveman, power necessarily has focused on the immediate future, like whether or how to kill members of a tribe that are encroaching on one's own hunting grounds, or how to do the same thing, perhaps in less bloody ways, to rivals in one's own tribe. This is known as politics. Aristotle said that human beings are social and political animals, for better or worse. And he said that democracy based on groupthink or consensus or least common denominator is the worst kind of government. The other paradigm of thought and action is justice. This framework focuses not on the is, but on the ought. This requires recognition of an authority beyond mere human will and beyond majoritarian democracy, which is merely a tool of governance. In America, both the definition and practice of justice requires a strategy to rehabilitate religion as it was understood by America's founders. In the preamble to the American Constitution, the purposes of forming a more perfect union are stated to start with justice, which leads to peace, prosperity, and lastly, to freedom. Freedom is listed last because freedom without justice is merely license and can lead to chaos. Uh governance through a republic, uh, not a democracy. I mean, constitutional democracy is the same as a republic. A republic posits that the, the, the technique of majority vote is very useful to develop ishma, which is consensus. But the real purpose of a republic is to recognize that those who are elected are responsible to God. Uh, Jefferson emphasized this. Uh, his, his enemies said he was an atheist because he didn't believe in the Trinity. But he certainly understood uh, the, everything else important in Christianity. Justice, however, without a transcendent authority, recognized by the members of society, can lead to tyranny and to a 
imposition of a utopian totalitarian ideology that will preclude any possibility of peace, prosperity, and freedom. If justice is the product of merely of human will rather than of higher truth that humans were created to seek, justice will inevitably come, as Mao Zedong allegedly once claimed, from the barrel of a gun. All students of religion in America agree that during the past 40 years, America has been experiencing one of the periodic renaissance that mark America's history. One of the critical questions is whether this is good for human rights and good for justice because some trends in this revival are not necessarily good for either. The people cannot remain virtuous unless they are aware of divine providence. Now, divine providence means God. Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, was not uh, a deist. A deist said God created the world and then disappeared. From then on, it's up to man to do what he wants. A theist says God created the world and constantly sustains it so that we can use our free will to build a better world. <laughs> the immediate question being addressed is the relationship between religion and human rights. Specifically, which brand of religious tradition is trying to support human rights? One perspective is that the most important question is not whether specific religious traditions are addressing human rights, but who is trying to revive human rights as a systemic paradigm for viewing all human life based on a traditionalist or classical system of thought that may have been lost in the modern age. In other words, it is a question of conscious transformation from the imminent to the transcendent. The most comprehensive paradigm of Islamic thought is the natural law of compassionate justice. The concept of natural law is classical Islamic thought is known as Sunnah Allah or the ways of God. Justice, love, and compassion are the broadest concepts within this paradigm, known respectively as Akal, Hump, and Rahman. They make up the universal paradigm found in all the world religions. The sentient being created as part of the perfection of God in the universe uh, is going to be aware of God. That's our, that's our nature. We can deny it, but it's still our nature. We're free not to respect our own nature, but it's there. And, and that's common to all the world religions. Both Western and Islamic thought and many shelves of books have been written by scholars in every religion on this subject. Muslim scholars until recently have been skeptical about the use of the term natural law in the West because during the 19th century it became synonymous with the term secular in the sense of hostility towards religion. Uh, well, I would say all religions uh, also are aware of and respect the love, God's love and love in general as a key to everything else. Now the Prophet Muhammad said, uh, his, his uh, f a favorite prayer was Allahumma asaluka hubaka, uhuba man yuhibuka, uhuba kuli amala yukariboni ili hubika. Oh uh, Allah, I ask you for your love, for the love of everybody who loves you, and for the love of everything that will bring me closer to your love. And, and you know, this is the essence of every religion. The best example is Hittinger's book because he spells out, although unknowingly, the traditionalist Islamic position. Hittinger states, Every person is created to know God and share God's love. 
because God, as the initiator, loves every person. In other words, a person does not care about and help others simply because this makes one happy, because this is everyone's nature. And one can be happy only when one is true to one's own nature and purposes created by God. Of course, one is free to seek happiness as a selfish goal in itself, which would be self-defeating. The basic premise of human nature based on the search for truth and love is known in Quranic terms as in fact which is the inclination to give rather than take in life. This explains the nature of all law, but especially Islamic law, which is designed primarily to educate, not to enforce. When specific rules have to be enforced, the law itself has failed. Uh, following the American Constitution, we should be following the power of example. The United States should be example to the world. That's the most powerful thing there can be. Yeah. But people who don't understand the deeply spiritual nature of America cannot understand that. So they want to be, uh, they, they want to use their own power as an example to the rest of the world. So everybody will accept America as the, the leader of the world. But leadership does not uh, even, doesn't require Power, leadership doesn't even admit power. Yeah. Yeah. Leadership is based on principles. If you follow principles, you're a leader. The purpose of natural law theory, writes Hissinger, is to discover or assert the prior premises of law. These coalesce around the three focuses, order of the divine mind, metaphorically speaking, order in nature, and order in the human mind. Hissinger explains how the great traditions of natural law allowed each of these focuses to have its own solace depending on the problem at hand. This framework gives guidance to both the legislature and the judiciary. Through this framework, the so-called lawmakers are given by a higher law than themselves, and through it, the judges are able intelligently to apply the legislative intent. This was the clear intent of virtually all of America's founders because they were convinced that the worst system of governance is democracy in which the people govern as a form of mob rule without any higher guidance. They wanted to separate organized religion in the form of the church from organized politics in the form of the state, but they wanted to do so only to be sure that dogmatic faith would never supplant reason and that uninformed reason would never become the enemy of faith. But this is a message that uh, has to be taught in the schools. Yeah. And, uh, we're losing that. The, 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 uh, I mean, secularism in the sense of, you know, using the, the, the riches of the world to benefit everybody, that's good. But militant secularism means you deny everything except physical well-being. And if everybody seeks physical goals, that's the end of civilization. Thomas Jefferson wrote, that no people can remain free unless they are properly educated. True education consists primarily in learning virtue and that no people can remain virtuous unless both their personal and private lives are infused with the awareness and love of God. Ibn Khaldun uh, first developed the concept of the civilization challenge and response. Uh, and he said, civilization will rise when you respond to your challenges. Civilization will collapse when you don't. Uh, so what are the challenges? One of the major challenges is when you no longer follow any higher principles, transcendent principles of truth, 
you follow just power. All our certainties should be based on humility before God and the knowledge that he is the ultimate source of all certainty and not to act on a provisional understanding of certainty as if it were real certainty. I don't like the term moderation uh, because it could mean you're halfway between what's bad and what's good. You're a moderate. You're not really bad. You're not really good. You're moderate. I don't like that definition of moderation. <laughs> uh, moderation means that you avoid uh, emphasizing any one aspect of reality to the ex exclusion of everything else, uh, for, such as emphasizing physical power versus love. Uh, you don't want to be a moderate by saying, I want a little bit of power and a little bit of love. Because <laughs> they don't mix. <laughs> As the philosophers say, we live in a world of contingency, a world of existence, but existence is created by the ultimate, from which it is contingent and therefore can not in any way be absolute. I would say it is relevant because if you follow the principles of compassionate justice, that will be the ultimate means to achieve power. But it won't be the power to impose your will on others. It will be uh, the power to respect other people's wills too. Perhaps the most profound sentence in the entire Quran, though rarely invoked by Muslims today, is, the message of your Lord is completed and perfected in truth and in justice. This connects holistically the three elements of what, hence, and why in discussing ultimate truth. This verse of the Quran is saying first that the ontologically true simply is in the same way that God defined himself to Moses at the burning bush simply as I am. Epistemologically, that truth is accessible to humans, if only partially through divine revelation as well as through human observation and reason. And third, axiologically, that truth can and must be actualized by defining and practicing justice. The first discipline is called ontology. That's the study of truth. Uh, in, in the Quran, uh, it says, wa tamat kalimat wa rabika sidkan wa adlan. The word of your Lord uh, is perfected in, uh, in truth and in justice. And another one, wa min mahalakna umatun yaktuna bil haqqi wa bihi adilun. And, and among the communities, we have created one that is guided by truth and applies it in justice. Now, he's not saying, you know, there is one that does that. It's very clear. He's talking that every community is created with that potential. The second most profound message within this message is the use of the term kalama, or word. It is similar to the Christian logos, or word of your Lord, though Christians usually reference it to Jesus, just as many Muslims use it in reference to the Quran. Both are messengers of the good word. The message is not merely an expression of God's will, but a manifestation of the being of God as ultimate truth, which is unique and beyond our grasp as contingent creations of God, but remains an object of our search for the higher understanding. The concept of Logos has been central to the philosophical and theological discussion of all three of the Abrahamic religions. A dialogue may be formulated as the effort to distinguish among existence, being, and beyond being, 
about which three schools of thought crystallize in classical Islam. The Musazilites argued a thousand years ago that Allah is what many theologians in many religions call beyond being, and that Allah is, in essence, reasonable and cannot be unreasonable or unjust. In other words, he cannot be what he is not, and neither can the Quran be other than what it is. Uh, how can you combine uh, the search for truth, the, the, the search to explain it in principles, and to apply it? There are three basic strategies uh, that I you know, think are important. Uh, the first one is called the Benedict Option. It's named after Saint Benedict, who lived right at the end of the Roman Empire. And the uh, Ostrogoths and the Visigoths took over all of Europe. At, at one point, their religion, which is called uh, Arianism, uh, dominated all of Western Christianity. Every single bishop in the West was an Arian, except the bishop from, from uh, Ireland. Uh, St. Thomas, uh, no, I mean, uh, St. Benedict said one way to survive this horrible heresy uh, and, and whatever would come from it, I mean, some of the Ostrogoths are not the nicest people. <laughs> he said the, the way to survive it is to uh, separate yourself from the world and maintain the values, maintain the religion uh, in monasteries, uh, uh, waiting for the time when it's ready to rebuild another civilization. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas had a, excuse me, St. Francis uh, of Assisi had a totally opposite paradigm or strategy. Sure. He said, you bring the, the truth of Jesus uh, through every street and from the housetops. Uh, and that strategy is what saved Europe from Genghis Khan. Uh, St. Francis and Gen Genghis Khan were born in the same year. And uh, medieval Europe was falling apart. I mean, actually, that's one reason why the other crusades, to, <laughs> to bring the Europeans together again. <laughs> but they were falling apart. And St. Thomas revived the best of European religion and thought. And that's one reason, it's not the only reason, that old man Genghis Khan died and so his troops, troops retreated, but uh, he would have defeated Europe if they'd been divided. Uh, so St. Thomas, I mean, St. Francis of Assisi uh, was a model of civilization building. And the third one, the third strategy is by what I call uh, Islam. You do both of them at the same time. Cool. <laughs> the Salafis argued that Allah is not being or beyond being, but is all will, that whatever Allah wills is reasonable and just, and that the Quran as an act of creation could have been different than what it is. This was great for justifying tyrants who claim that Allah has abrogated parts of the Quran and that their tyranny was part of the divine will. Each of these groups became extremists by arguing that its position trumps the other ones, namely, either that reason trumps revelation or revelation trumps reason. The Asarites took an intermediate position and argued that neither trumps the other because there cannot possibly be a difference between revelation and enlightened reason, and in modern times between religion and science. The worst example of non-normative law is what I learned uh, in three years at Harvard Law School. Uh, Harvard Law School follows the case method. According to the case method, there are no principles. You know, I would ask, what's the principle of this case? And the professor would really knock me down and say, we do not have principles. What are you doing here at Harvard Law School if you ask about principles? Uh, no principles. The case method, uh, if you want to win a case, 
you, for your client, you find a similar case in which a judge ruled what would be in favor of your client. If you can do that, you win the case. Uh, <laughs> this, this is called Austinian law, as distinct from natural law. Uh, there are two buildings at Harvard Law School. One is called uh, Austin Hall. That's the main building. Uh, that was named after Austin, who invented the case method, uh, which means wh whatever uh, judges have said is true and is law is true and is law, period. Uh, the other one was story, story building. Uh, Justice Story was in the U.S. Supreme Court. He represented natural law, which is the basis of the entire American experiment. Uh, but for some reason, I, I've never really figured this out, there, there was a transition from natural law to Austinian law at Harvard and everywhere else. Uh, natural law is, con is very controversial today. Yeah, why? Why is that? Uh, it's, it's controversial first uh, because it can be used in the Austinian sense uh, and, and is. It's a perversion of natural law. Uh, and so people are afraid to talk about natural law because it, it might, because it's used uh, in the exact opposite sense. Uh, Muslims, well, uh, Imon, An Anbar Imon is the principal, uh, I think the world's leading authority on uh, Muslim on natural law. He published a, a book, uh, the, the Trialogue, the Natural Law Trial, a Jewish Christian Muslim Trialogue. Uh, and uh, I was hoping he would edit a, a, a issue of the journal that I was editing, uh, Armonia, uh, and he changed his mind. He said, this is too controversial. I, I, I really can't. I mean. Other Muslims would say, why are you supporting natural law is so viciously secular, uh, when in fact it's the exact opposite. The tragedy is that members of the synonal schools of thought in the Islamic heritage so often have refused to listen to each other. How do we access ultimate truth? The next question in the discussion of ultimate and absolute truth is, where does absolute truth come from? The issue is both whether and how humans who exist in a contingent universe but come from a reality beyond the physical universe can have access to a reality beyond this reality, namely to God. How are absolute power, absolute compassion, and absolute truth, which are the three major attributes of Allah, communicated to us as human beings who in no way are absolute ourselves? The answer may be we are closer to God than all of existence because we were created beyond this level in the realm of being and shall return to it. Allah revealed in the Quran, we are closer to the human person than is his own juggler vein. Physical science cannot prove this any more than it can offer any proof about the nature of God or human beings, since science is limited to the lowest level of reality. All traditionalist religions teach that it would require the most absurd arrogance to conclude that therefore what science cannot measure cannot exist. Reason, however, is essential for human beings to understand what is beyond the direct perception of most people. It is tempting for people who have a fear of science as possibly threatening faith to dismiss both science and human reason based upon it in the search for reality. Secular persons have the same fear in reverse. As Professor Fatima Jackson 
of the University of Maryland put it in an exchange at a blog of the Scholars Chair in 2009, such secularists assume that science and religion are not overlapping spheres of understanding, and when they interface, science loses. I find this perspective very unsatisfying and also historically inadequate. No wonder our science is so fragmented. It is practice in the absence of any reality. Of course, our religion, or what passes for religion, is often in even worse shape. Part of the problem is the tribalistic identification of oneself and one's community as uniquely secular or uniquely faith-based and therefore at odds with or in competition and inevitable conflict with the other. Ibn Khaldun, who wrote, at the time of the Mongol invasion in the 13th century, defined the problem as one of community loyalty, which can be either good or bad. The bad community loyalty is self-justification with no concern with other communities. This is the basis of the ghetto mentality that rightly fears suicide through assimilation. Good community loyalty is pride in one's own community as a basis for cooperation with other communities in bringing out the best of both. This is the basis and essence of integration, which is more Islamic than the avoidance of assimilation through the extremism of confrontational rejectionism. Most religious people believe that their religion is the most universalist in the world. This should give them the confidence to invoke other faith traditions in defense of human rights, particularly concerning themselves, just as they should evoke their own scriptures in defense of universal issues, particularly those that primarily concern others. The spiritual perspective of human rights is shared equally and entirely by the greatest traditionalist thinkers in both Christianity and Islam as well as in Judaism. They recognize a direct relationship of the person with God and therefore conceives of human rights as sacred, including the right of persons and communities to a government that is limited by the sovereignty of God. Above all, they recognize that the practice of morality, traditionally known as the virtues, is the purpose of spiritual wisdom and is not independent of it. In the language of Christianity, which means that moral theology is united with dogmatic theology in a single discipline of knowledge. And finally, classical Islamic thought is built further on the conviction that both the source and the place are united in natural theology, known as natural law, or the Sunnah Allah. This is expressed in the Islamic conception of knowledge based on Haq al yaqim divine revelation, and al yaqim observation of the universe, and Ilm al yaqim the human reason that combines the two. If one's personal relations of loving submission to God, which Muslims call taqwa, is the essence of higher religion, then the human right known as freedom of religion is axiomatic. The ultimate freedom is when one's only desire, as Thomas Merton once put it, is to become a person that one is, in other words, to become the person that God created one to be.